Next, we have Dr. Joe Fox. He's. Uh, we're going to get you four in a row from a and Corpus Christi, and then we're going to eat lunch. Uh, Dr. Fox, Joe is a aquatic nutritionist at the Heart Research Institute at A&M Corpus Christi, investigating sargassum. You're right. It's worse than mine, Joe. <laughs> Five. But and he, and he, got, he got his PhD in 1992 from A&M College Station. But <clears throat> there was a, a a lot of what kicked this whole thing off back in. Uh, October of last year, the Coastal Bend Base Foundation had their Coastal Issues Forum, and and I I quickly added Joe to the to the to the venue or to the agenda, and he's got some cool ideas of how to what we can do with some of this sargassum. Take it away, Joe. All right. Dim the light. Dim the light. Just a switch. Kill me. Okay, well, I'd like to uh, you can turn that this thing, You can pull that off if you want to hold it. Yeah. No, I'll just stand There's here. There's the little clicker, whatever happened to the clicker. I've got it. Oh, you got it. Anyhow, uh, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers of this symposium for asking me to come here. And this, is, uh, this presentation is going to be somewhat of a departure from what you've been uh, listening to uh, earlier. Um, the title of it is The Alternative Uses of Sargassum. Uh, by no means have I compiled an entire list of all the alternative uses, and I'd also like to uh, uh, preface what I'm going to present to you by saying that some of these I don't necessarily agree with, but nonetheless there are going to be uh, some things to consider for the future. Uh, a lot of people have been talking about uh, sargassum this morning, and uh, I wanted to reference the uh, first actual uh, uh, documentation of sargassum, which was uh, provided to us by Christopher Columbus on his uh, first voyage to the New World where he mistook it for land and uh, described it as large patches of yellow, yellowish green weed. Uh, concerned that he couldn't go through it, he decided then to steer around it and the rest is all history. <laughs> Most of the sargassum that we encounter is uh, one of these two different species here. And they account for about 90% of the uh, uh, assemblage of sargassum that we find washing up on our beaches here starting in the early spring. It's also about 90% of the species that you find in the Sargasso Sea, but that might be changing as I'll point out in a little while. Some of the common complaints or concerns that people have uh, voiced about sargassum is that and they've all been brought up before here, the uh, restricting access to the beaches, the uh, uh, odiferous odor. <laughs> the, it also traps materials uh, such as seeds, animals, decaying matter, and anthropogenic litter uh, from the water column. Uh, it interferes, or it, uh, one of the complaints is that it interferes with turtles looking for nesting sites, trying to get back out to the ocean, could affect egg hatching and uh, the negative effect on tourism. But at the same time, it has a lot of ecological roles to play. And one, which will probably be brought up after this presentation, is that it serves as a complex uh, habitat for many different types of epipelagic species. And it is important for the survival of these species that rely upon it. Uh, it actually contains several orders of magnitude higher uh, numbers of organisms in the open ocean waters, uh, waters that are not containing the sargassum itself. It has also been recognized as essential fish habitat by the National Marine Fisheries Service, and its role is, again, not completely understood, but we're, I think we're making some strong inroads into that. Some of the ecological services in more detail uh, uh, I found this particular documentation, and it, it, I found it rather impressive that it's habitat for greater than 100 species of fish, fungi, micro and macrophytes, 145 species of invertebrates, four species of sea turtles, and numerous marine birds. Uh, it is also important, as somebody brought up, uh, I believe Amy brought up earlier, that it is uh, important in terms of nutrient cycling from the ocean to the shore. 
It's a habitat for amphipods and crabs on shore and other species that were mentioned by uh, Dr. Withers. And uh, on a biogeochemical scale, it's important for nitrogen fixation via epiphytic blue-green algae that uh, grow on the sargassum. <clears throat> As a fishery, uh, the United States doesn't consider it much of a fishery. In fact, there's really only one boat that's known to go out and harvest sargassum from the ocean uh, out of Buf Buford, North Carolina. And some of the biggest concerns that have been expressed are what goes on beyond the, the uh, exclu exclusive economic zone, uh, in, particularly in terms of destruction of turtle, turtle habitat. The new total allowable catch that I found uh, recently is about 5,000 pounds per vessel landed per year. Well, considering there's only one vessel out there fishing for it that I know of, uh, that's not a whole lot. Uh, because it's been designated as essential fish habitat, it's not necessarily economically viable from the U.S. perspective in terms of going out from land fishing for it and bringing it back in. Other questions that might be asked about it are, uh, are things like, can it be invasive? Can it be categorized as that? And yes, it is. It already is in England. And so the Sargassum buticum, <coughs> excuse me, is a classic example for its potential for spreading. Uh, it is a benthic species that colonizes rocky structures uh, and is considered, as I said, invasive in Great Britain. It had, just to get, give you an example of its ability to uh, uh, quote unquote migrate and be invasive, is that it was originally found in Japan, or it originated from Japan, and was then found in, uh, starting in 1944 in Canada. In 1973, it had crossed the Atlantic and was being noticed on shores of, of Great Britain. It, and in 1981, it had already migrated into the Mediterranean. In Ireland, they have a particularly bad problem with it, in, in, according to them, and that is that it is uh, invading about 54 kilometers of Irish coast per year. They've tried a lot of different solutions there, in, including harvesting, use of chemicals, etc., and none of that appears to be working for them. So my presentation today is about the practical uses of sargassum, some of the alternative uses. Some of them, after I give this, you might say, well, I don't know if they're that practical, and maybe I don't know myself. But everything from a nutrient source for uh, cultured animals or cultivated domesticated animals, including humans, I guess, uh, biosorption, greenhouse gas scrubbing, pharmaceuticals, which is already done in a big way, energy, which is being done in a big way in Japan, uh, seafood flavorings, and as a source of phycocolloids or alginates, binders, so to speak. We'll go into the source of nutrients. Uh, the composition is relatively similar among the different species that have information on the nutrient composition uh, we have information for, and it contains about 14% water, which is pretty interesting from the standpoint of nutrition. Uh, it's all a matter of whether you're dealing with fresh or dried fronts. Uh, it's reasonably high in protein, 13 to 16 percent, and therefore can be considered a source of nitrogen or a source of protein and amino acids for animals. Uh, it does obviously contain minerals. Uh, in particular, iodine, uh, and it's used in Japan, is a food supplement in order to treat gout. Uh, variation, again, exists according to season and whether you're dealing with uh, planktonic species or benthic species. If we look at the nutrient composition again, uh, one of the things I'm interested in is looking at carbon-nitrogen ratios. And there have been studies, uh, this one by LaPointe, which indicate that the carbon-nitrogen ratio is about 50 to 1 out in the, um, say, middle of the Atlantic in the Sargasso Sea. But as you get closer to shore, the uh, nitrogen concentration starts to eat into that a little bit more, so the nitrogen level goes up. Uh, some of the local sargassum that I uh, checked out here about two weeks ago actually had a carbon-nitrogen ratio of 13 to 1, so it's loading up nitrogen, uh, which is not 
probably uh, uh, should not come as a surprise to people, especially in the Gulf of Mexico and, and the uh, effluent coming out of the Mississippi River. So high nitrogen fixation via epiphytic blue-green algae. Again, this uh, carbon-nitrogen ratio is going to vary by species and season. Here's uh, LaPointe's work, and you can see some of the different sampling stations that he had. Uh, let me see where this is on here. Oh, I can't find it. Anyhow, that's all right. If you look off the coast there of Charleston, uh, you can see some of the sampling stations. There you go. <laughs> you just got it. Somewhere in there. Okay. Mystery. Now, oh, there it is. The there it is. Your, the clicker also is oh, that's all right. Uh, anyhow, I'm going to give up on that. <laughs> For the sake of time. No, there's a, in the center button is a point too. Oh, okay. Anyhow, here's one set of stations here, and these are the more neuritic ones here, and these are more oceanic, right? Anyhow, you can see in the more uh, uh, neuritic ones, the uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio is much lower than you have offshore, way offshore, and uh, also in terms of the carbon uh, uh, phosphorus ratio. So they're loading up with nutrients as they get closer to shore. Here's some work that was done by uh, uh, Turner and Rooker back in uh, 2006 where they looked at fatty acid concentrations. Everybody's into this, these health issues about uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, how they reduce the risk for uh, heart disease, etc. Well, they, uh, Turner and Rooker looked at the composition here in the Gulf of Mexico of sargassum fluid tens and uh, found that the monthly and yearly variation in the fatty acid concentration is quite low. So you can see here's a different fatty acid profiles here from May, June, July, August. You don't see much of a change there. And also from year to year down here. And, but it is rather high in uh, EPA and DHA. I won't bore you with the uh, scientific names for that, but that's a fairly high content. So it could be considered a, a, a source of, uh, of uh, these fatty acids for for health and nutrition. Uh, what they did see also was a big increase when you, where you go from autotrophs up to your heterotrophs in terms of the fatty acids. Just look how they change here. But there were not really any site differences that they could see. Well, if you're going to process this stuff uh, and you're worried about retaining nutrients, one of the problems is uh, how you dry the, the uh, sargassum. And what you can see here for this particular species, sun-dried, oven-dried, freeze-dried, that you have as you uh, remove more and more moisture, your protein obviously is going to go up. This is a very slow process, sun-drying, and so you can see your moisture departing here, oven-dried versus freeze-dried. So you have to bear that into, into consideration if you're going to process this somehow. The second uh, potential use is one that's known as biosorption. Uh, and one of the concerns is the, the dumping or the release of a lot of toxic metals into the aquatic environment. By biosorption, you're having the metals adhere to compounds or adhere to the sargassum. It's a low cost and effective technology for removing anthropogenic chemicals from water, and it uses readily available biomass from nature. So the bi term biosorption applies to all kinds of biomass, not just sargassum. Uh, marine seaweed is an excellent substrate for metals, for metals binding, and the cost using it as a biosorbent versus ion exchange uh, is much, much, much lower. And so it, it looks to be economically feasible. It has high metal, uh, metal binding capacity, as I said, and it appears, according to this research, that the brown seaweeds are superior to other algal species. It also has for this particular species, uh, the ability to take up more than 10% of its dry weight in aluminum, as you see here. So, so very good uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, sorbent. Now, here's an interesting slide here. And 
And I don't know if any of y'all remember this contest that was funded by Sir Richard Branson back in 2005, where the winner receives $25 million for best research idea for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, carbon emissions. Well, I went and looked at this on the internet, and the number one contender wanted to use huge waterborne forms of macroalgae, such as sargassum, for removal of CO2. Uh, and his research would involve 100 vast nets full of quick-growing seaweed, each measuring six miles by six miles, floating off the northeast coast of Japan. Uh, each net would produce somewhere around 270,000 metric tons of sargassum per year and harvest, be harvested in 12 months for biomass energy. Uh, part of the, and it's actually been adopted as part of Japan's technology roadmap for 2005. Uh, according to this particular article, it stated that uh, use of sargassum or seaweeds is a, a hundred times more efficient as a greenhouse gas grower than forest, does not require water, poses, and poses no competition with arable cropland. So there are some considerations there. Uh, the only problem is once it dries out, if you let it dry out too much, there goes the CO2 back to the atmosphere. So you might want to think about how you're going to approach this. Pharmacological uses, as I mentioned, that this is already very well in place, uh, particularly in uh, traditional Chinese medicine or TCM. It's characterized as having a cold nature and a salty, bitter taste. Uh, and as good as I mentioned before, at increasing dietary iodine as a treatment for goiter. So in other words, it's a good source of iodine. It also has, uh, as I see here, uh, uh, as I show you here in this particular research, possible antibacterial properties against Staphylococcus and E. coli compared to ampicillin. Other pharmacological uses include uh, the fact that it's rich in sulfated polysaccharides and has the following actions as a result of that. It's a, a potent free radical scavenger, um, cellular waste material or cell cellular waste product has antioxidant effects. In other words, it helps uh, uh, reduce the potential for peroxidation and spoilage. It's a hepatoprotective agent. And again, it reduces lipid peroxidation. The one that I found was most interesting is this one down here as an immuno, immunostimulant in that it's highly been shown to be a highly effective inhibitor of HIV. Number five. And we're moving along here. I mentioned is looking at this in a very big way. And I highlight down here what the fuel value in kilocalories per meter cube of seaweed is, as sort of a generic term, compared to petroleum gas. That's something for consideration. This is a typical method where you culture seaweed uh, or sargassum. You create a slurry. It then uh, goes through byproduct extraction, which could result in the uh, availability of a whole range of chemicals. It then goes through methane fermentation to produce biogas. The digestive residue from fermentation can be composted uh, and used as fertilizer or feed for terrestrial animals or aquatic animals. Here's uh, what's going on in Japan right now. Uh, it's been proposed uh, one farm of 41 kilometers square can generate 1 billion kilograms of wet weight biomass. Uh, government of Japan is really looking into this. After digestion, the gas generated is 52% methane, 43% CO2, and 0.6% uh, hydrogen sulfide. The estimated energy output from this digestion process is about 113 million uh, kilowatt hours, uh, which could fuel around 1.6 million homes. So they're really looking at it. But what's critical and to make it uh, cost effective is the extraction of byproducts, byproduct chemicals. Uh, the production of energy by sargassum falls in the category of marine biomass. And actually, the United States once considered it as an alternative fuel source post the oil embargo back in 1973, but studies discontinued with the price stabilization of oil. Now, uh, 
Marine biomass represents renewable energy and is considered carbon neutral. So what you take out, you put back, or you take out, you put back in. There's a steady state, there's a balance in there. And many island nations are considering macroalgal biomass as an alternative fuel source. This is a pilot project uh, by Tokyo Gas. Number six, seafood flavoring. Sargassum contains small amounts of bromelated phenols or bromophenols. And in a nutshell, what that does is it, it uh, imparts a, an ocean-like or sea-like flavor to any kind of tissue that is incorporating it. So a sea-like taste and flavor. We don't know what the ecological role of bromophenols are, but it could be uh, for chemical defense and as a deterrent. Uh, studies have been done to show that it takes the bland and turns it into flavorful. And so it can contribute, a, uh, uh, they can contribute recognizable marine or ocean flavors to seafoods as well as enhance the intensity of existing seafood flavors. And so depending upon the type of bromophenol you incorporate in the animal typically, or the tissue typically by feeding the animal and harvesting it, you can get all kinds of different flavors. Uh, there have been some studies, which I'll just go through quickly here, that show that uh, uh, this has actually been undertaken uh, with uh, rainbow trout, crayfish, and channel catfish. And taste panel uh, participants observed notable changes in appearance of edible trout and crayfish tissue and preferred the bromophenol modified flavor of experimental animals over that of untreated controls. Last one, uh, FICO. Colloids and alginates, basically they're gelatinous gum-like materials derived from macroalgae. Uh, sargassum in particular is used for the development of alginates or binders. One of the reasons that it is, it is harvested and extracted is because it's very difficult to synthesize. And so the Japanese, Koreans, uh, North Koreans, South Koreans, etc. Are using are actually obtaining this from the natural environment. Really, what they're doing is they're doing a lot of culture too. Used as emulsifiers and dairy products, leather, textile, and pharmaceutical industries. It's also used for gel encapsulation, laxative, cosmetic creams, and paper manufacture. Very hard to get away from. There's about 42 countries that produce phyco uh, colloids from macroalgae. And the leader is China because it has a lot of coastline. Uh, total production is about 13.8 billion pounds of fresh weight. And uh, sargassum actually accounts for about 43% of the total culture. So the question is, can you cultivate it? Well, currently 85% of the phycocolloids and, and products are coming from aquaculture and about 15% are harvested. If you're going to grow uh, uh, natans, which is one of the species that enters the Gulf of Mexico, uh, it typically will grow best at 25 degrees Celsius and 39 parts per thousand, a uh, little higher than typical marine strength, right? Nominal. You can expect a doubling rate of about 0.05 per day, and at that rate, 100 pounds of fresh weight macroalgae or sargassum becomes 430 pounds in one month. It's phenomenal growth. Uh, the growth is, again, ultimately limited by temperature and nutrient availability, and it's probably not advisable to use a benthic species. And so what you can see here is there's a lot of uh, slightly offshore culture going on. And in summary, uh, sargassum has many actual and potential uses. It provides many species and uh, many services to the environment and we must carefully consider how it might be used. Everything has a cost associated with it nowadays. We're in changing times. Uh, we want to make sure that we take the steps in the right direction. And there's a lot of question out there, again, as mentioned earlier uh, today, as to whether it should be exploited at all. And this is a sign from Quintana, Texas, right here, pointing out the value of sargassum seaweed. And that's it. Any questions? Yes. Um, all of these, uh, like biosorbs and metal grabbing, does all of that have to be when it's alive? 
Uh, no, not necessarily at all. So, like, we can pick up the yeah. dried stuff and, and yeah. biosorb or something like mm -hmm. that? If you wanted to. Any other questions? Yes. You said Japan was using the seaweed that they collected as for bioenergy? Mm -hmm. There is a pilot project. Yeah. Are they uh, being very careful not to get the metals that they have absorbed onto the seaweed and take it out of their air pollution? Uh, I'm not certain about that. If you saw the stack on that prototype plant, yeah. there it looked like it had a scrubber on it or something. So that's a possibility. I haven't looked into that. I would certainly hope they would. I wouldn't hope. Would, <laughs> would try to do it any other way. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Joe.